the quality of answer you get from a large language model depends on how you ask the question. This has given rise to what's called prompt engineering, which combines rules of thumb with trial and error to get the best answers. While prompt engineering works well, it's time consuming and it's also brittle if you try to use the same prompt for different tasks. This is what DSPY aims to address by providing a systematic way to generate prompts. If you're integrating large language models into consumer or business apps, you probably should consider DSPY or something like it. And that's because it provides you with more robust and reliable answers while spending less time on prompt engineering. In this video, I'll explain how DSPY works and how to integrate it within your code. For what it's worth, DSPY, it stands for something that seems to be a bit loose, but roughly declarative self-improving programs. Declarative because it gives a structure to how the prompt is prepared. Self-improving because you can apply optimization to how that prompt is built. We'll see that and programs because, yeah, I guess uh, it helps you with your programs or it is itself a program for writing the prompts. Quite simply for this video, I'm going to walk through a notebook in full and I'm going to stack techniques. So I'll start off with a Q&A data set and see the baseline performance with a naive prompt and I'll stack some classic techniques like chain of thought, then I'll add retrieval. So they're kind of boring. Then I'll add uh, a few shot examples then I'll add optimized few shot examples, which really leverages DSPY. Then I'll add multi-hop retrieval with few shot, shot examples. Then I'll add multi-hop retrieval with optimized few shot examples. And as a bonus, I'll talk a little about how you can use what's called assertions. This is another way to um, ensure high quality answers as measured, for example, by length of response or structure of response. And later on, if there's interest, let me know in the comments. I'll make a video on agents. There is a specific agents feature within DSPY uh, for supporting React agents. Um, there are agents that take three steps in providing response and can access tools. So yeah, let me know about that in the comments. Now, at a high level, just to share why is DSPY helpful in addition to just bundling what you already might know about prompting techniques? Well. It allows you to optimize the best few shot examples. So it's common knowledge that if you give examples in your prompt, it will help the answer. Um, but to take that one step further, you can run a process that optimizes which examples should be included. And second of all, DSPY is particularly good for generating end-to-end uh, -end examples in long, in long retrieval techniques or long multi-step queries. For example, if you ask a question and then that question leads to a search query being generated and that search query retrieves information and that retrieved information is summarized. This is a multi-hop process, like what happens if you use perplexity. And many of the evaluations of language models do not consider these multi-step type processes. They don't really consider multi-turn conversations much, although I know some people are working on eval sets like that. Um, so that means this is an area where there's not necessarily a lot of knowledge and DSPY because it's structured and because it would be tedious to generate few shot examples for such uh, long types of conversations or tasks, DSPY is kind of a good fit. If that doesn't fully make sense yet, that's okay. DSPY is one of those things that's kind of hard to grasp at a high level, but a lot easier when you see some worked examples. So with that, we'll move into a notebook uh, setup. Just as background, there are two things that have been prepared in advance. The first is Hot Pot QA, and not prepared by me. They've been prepared by the authors of DSPY. And in fact, they probably didn't even prepare Hot Pot QA. I'm not sure about that. Either way, Hot Pot QA is a question and answer data set. Um, it's got 100 and, uh, question and answer pairs. So you can check it out there on Hugging Face. And this is just going to provide a set of answers we can test the quality of our prompts on. And it will also serve as training data for optimizing our prompts. You'll see what that means in a little bit. Second of all, um, there is a set of Wikipedia articles that has been indexed. So basically a RAG database has been set up. In other words, each Wikipedia article has been assigned a slot in this database and vector embeddings have been created. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if the vector embeddings are in there, but either way, there's an index database of Wikipedia that I think the DSPY team have set up. And that's handy because we're going to use it when we introduce retrieval augmented generation within the prompts that we set up. So I just wanted to mention that we'll see these both being introduced in the notebook uh, when we get to it. So for a notebook, uh, you're going to have two options. DSPY have got 
quite a large set of notebooks available, uh, one of which is called intro.ipynb. I'll put a link below. This is a freely available notebook here. And based on this notebook, um, based heavily on this notebook, I have run through it and made some adjustments uh, so that we can run a nice comparison of all these techniques. So I've adjusted this notebook and it's available for those who have lifetime access to the advanced vision repo or rather the advanced inference repo. This is one of the Trellis repositories that has a lot of inference techniques like Monte Carlo, security fact checking, and now DSPY. Uh, just so you know where to find it, simply head to the DSPY folder and grab the DSPY performance notebook. There's also a work in progress multi-agent notebook there for members who uh, are welcome to try it out, although it is a work in progress. So I'm going to grab that notebook and open it up in Collab. We're not going to be linked to any GPUs here other than APIs like OpenAI. So there's no need for any GPU or self. That means you can run easily on Collab. You can, of course, use a service like RunPod or VastAI if you wish. Now, to get started, we're going to um, make sure we're connected and run a few of these uh, loading steps. So this installation is going to install DSPY and it'll also install OpenAI because I'm going to use, uh, am I going to use an OpenAI model? Um, I might actually, yeah, I think I'll use an OpenAI model. If you want something fast, you could use uh, Grok or you could use uh, Fireworks. The Llama 8B model is quite fast there. So I've got my API key set up here in secrets and you just need to turn on the ones that you're going to use. I'll run this installation step here and I'm going to import my API key because this is my OpenAI API key and set the model. So I'll use GPT-40 Mini. I want a fairly strong model, but we will be running quite a lot of inference. So I don't want to uh, spend the house on an eater. Now, right here, you'll see we are importing from a URL. This is a server that has the index of the Wikipedia articles uh, set up by DSPY. And we're importing it here uh, with the help of the DSPY library and this vector embedding service, um, not service, but object Culbear v2. So this is a set of embeddings and it's going to allow us to embed the articles uh, within that index. So I'll go ahead and run that and just notice that DSPY needs to be configured to run with a language model, which is mini. Mini is GPT-40 mini and or M, which uh, retrieval model, I guess, or M is going to be the Culbear embeddings model uh, with access to the Wikipedia articles. So we're basically going to run a QA uh, on Hotpot QA here. We're just uploading or rather downloading the data set using DSPY datasets. We're um, to save on costs. I'm just going to run 20 uh, samples for training. This will make sense in a bit when I talk about training. I'll set a seed for reproducibility and I'll use 50 samples here for the dev set. So you'll see where that comes into play later. But for now, I'm just going to load those data and I'm going to quickly print out some examples here. In fact, I've already run these cells earlier. You can see this question, what's the nationality of the chef and restaurateur featured in restaurant? Impossible. And the answer is, um, the yeah, the answer is English. The relevant Wikipedia titles are these ones here. So yeah, this database not only um, gives us a list of questions and answers, but it's also going to give us a list of relevant titles so that we can measure the accuracy of retrieval. So there's a list of relevant articles. And then when we run retrieval using our model, we can see if that matches the relevant articles. So this is all still set up here. Um, and yeah, as I said already, the training example has got questions and answers and the dev examples have got questions, answers, and also gold titles, which just means the most relevant um, the most relevant indexed articles within Wikipedia to that question. So with that, we're ready now to run through our examples. And I'm going to do exactly what I said um, in the PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to start off with a raw example where we literally ask a naive question. So this will just be asking a question like, like uh, I showed up here. And this is how we ask a question with DSPY. We set up a class. And this class is going to have uh, an input field, which will be question. And it's going to have an answer, which will be defined by an output field. And DSPY will allow us to provide a description for these fields. 
And this description you'll see later becomes part of the prompt and it helps to guide the model that the response should be often between one and five words. So we'll define uh, this structure here for basic QA. And now we're going to run a very simple um, basic QA. So we're going to generate an answer using DSPY predict, um, inputting this basic QA um, class. And then we're going to generate an answer by passing in one of the questions from the dev set. Uh, and this here will be the prediction and the prediction uh, is going to have an answer portion in it here. We can also just, uh, if you want, print the prediction itself to see what that contains. So if you want to see what pred contains, we can do something like this here. So here's the question uh, from the dev set. Uh, here's the, the answer that it provides. And just so you see prediction, this currently just contains an answer. It doesn't contain any other information. So that's why we just directly printed the answer here. So this is how you generate an answer by asking a straightforward question. And if you want to see under the hood how this works, you can do mini, that's uh, the model, because we loaded the model as uh, the mini variable. So mini.inspect history, n equals one, just shows us one, uh, one step into the past of history. And here's exactly what this looks like. So it's already nicely formatted. Answer questions with short factoid answers. Follow the following format. Question equals question. Answer often between one and five year words. And then it asks the question and the answer provided by language models in green here, which is American. And here you can see it in stringified format. So already using DSPY, just with basic QA format, we're not providing any uh, examples, but we are providing a very clearly formatted question and a very clear format in which the language model should answer. So this is, uh, this is step zero of using DSPY. So now we want to get a benchmark and see how this performs uh, on a range of questions. And I've run this evaluation here on 50 different questions. And you can see that using this uh, simple style of prompting here, no chain of thought, no few shot examples, um, we're getting 10 out of 50 correct. And no retrieval, by the way. We're not even providing access yet to the Wikipedia articles. So the baseline knowledge of the model for these questions, which includes what river is near the Crichton Collegiate Church, um, it's getting this wrong. So it's getting most of the questions wrong. It's getting uh, 10 out of 50 correct for a score of 20%. So this is our benchmark. And now we're going to start tacking on prompting techniques and see how much we can increase this performance. So the next, uh, the next level of performance, and I should probably try and run these cells so that I don't fall behind, even though it's quicker for me just to show you the outputs from earlier. The next step is that we're going to add in chain of thought. Chain of thought means you just ask the model to reflect a little bit before it gives an answer. And that's done using DSPY chain of thought. It's quite simple. You see here, we're doing DSPY.chain of thought and passing in basic QA. The only difference what we were doing before is that previously we did DSPY predict. So with predict, it's not adding chain of thought, but when we pass it in to chain of thought, it is gonna ask a uh, chain of thought. So here, just showing the question, same question, and it's going to give us a predicted answer. And we can look at the history. And here, what you can see is uh, now the format that's been requested is a bit more elaborate. It says follow the following format, question, reasoning. Let's think step by step in order to produce the answer. And then it's saying we step by step. Answer often between one and five words. So basically with chain of thought, the difference is that the model has to now give this line. And you can see in the answer, it uh, will output, let's think by step by step in order to, and here the model is saying the term of the chef's nationality, the chef featured in restaurant impossible is Robert Irvine, who is from the United Kingdom, answer British. So this is chain of thought, and I think that has already improved the answer. Of course, this is just one question. So we would go on and we would analyze this uh, for multiple questions. So let me just run these cells. And here we'll evaluate on hot pot. And you can see we're now getting 17 out of 50. So again, we're not retrieving anything from the database. We're not providing a uh, few shot examples. Few shot examples means we would provide questions plus complete answers. Just because we provide this structure doesn't mean it's few shot. It just means that we're providing um, some kind of layout for the response, which is helpful. So already here, and there's some noise because I'm not running a large number of samples, but 
the performance probably has improved. Uh, it's gone up to 34% from 20% 20, 20 correct uh, when we didn't use chain of thought. So that's a uh, chain of thought. Now we're going to stack on the next technique, which is retrieval augmented generation. Now you'd expect this will help a lot because the model may not have specific Wikipedia knowledge, or at least it doesn't remember it. So when we give it access to Wikipedia, basically all of Wikipedia, that should be a big boost. So the way we'll do that is we'll set up um, retrieve and K equals three means we're going to retrieve the three most relevant uh, paragraphs according to vector similarity. I'm actually not sure if it's cosine or dot. That would depend on how the model is trained too, but either way, it's vector similarity and it's going to allow us to get the top K passages, which in this case uh, pulls out an article on Restaurant Impossible. Seems relevant. Uh, an article on John Joho. Don't really know if that's relevant. And then list of restaurants, impl impossible episodes. Seems relevant. So anyway, these are the top three articles. And of course, if you try and retrieve more, that'll affect the performance. Maybe it's better because you have more chance of getting the relevant article. So we'll define this here. And we'll then do retrieve, um, do retrieval just on a test question. So here we could do retrieval on when the World Cup was held and it retrieves three articles. Actually, we're just printing one though, the first one, because it's zero based indexing and it's pulled out the history of the World Cup uh, Wikipedia article. So looks like retrieval is working well. Now we're going to generate a new class. You'll remember we had a class for doing basic question answering, uh, basic QA we called it, but now we're going to generate one that includes context. So not only do we have a question and an answer, we're going to include a context now as another. So let's define that and then set up our retrieval augmented generation. So here's what the retrieval augmented generation will do. It will be initiated with a retrieval method, which will retrieve the top K passages. And it will then um, have a chain of thought available for generating an answer. So we're going to combine retrieval with chain of thought. And you can see here, in the forward method. So it kind of looks like we're doing PyTorch or something, but we're at a more abstracted level. What we're going to do is retrieve um, the context, which will be the passages that will use this retrieval method here. And then we'll make a prediction uh, using generate answer by passing in the context and the question. And yeah, so generate answer is being defined using chain of thought here and passing in generate answer, which we have just defined uh, up here to include context question and answer. So we'll define this class and now we can run this uh, forward method on when was the first Rugby World Cup and we should expect it to find passages, pass those as context, pass in the question and get out the answer. We can do that now. And then we'll look at how this uh, whole prompt is. So the prompt is getting more complicated uh, in a good way, hopefully. Answer question with short factoid answers, follow the following format. Now we have this context. So previously we just had the question, the answer, we added chain of thought here. Now we're adding context. And here we have the actual context retrieved, the question, the reasoning, here's the chain of thought, and then here's the answer. So this is now combining chain of thought, retrieval, and uh, that's pretty much it. So we'll evaluate that on Hotpot and we'll run it again on 50 different questions. And you can see we're up from 17 to 21 questions correct. So that's 42%. Again, maybe some error in that. Um, so certainly doesn't seem to have hurt. Probably did improve the performance by adding that uh, retrieval because now it's grounded uh, in more facts. So where do we go next? Well, we can add a few shot. We can add some examples. So quite simply, we're going to uh, inject some correct answers. Now, obviously we won't put the correct answers that could appear in the actual question we're asking, because that would be pure uh, contamination and giving it away. What we need to do is split the base uh, Q&A data set up so that we have some questions we will use as few shot examples, and then we will just do the testing on a separate data set. And that's why we're going to have the train set, which we'll split over here to use for few shot examples, and then an independent, ideally. Now, in principle, it should be pretty independent. There's probably some chance for uh, contamination between the two, although probably small. So we're going to have the train set for using few shots, and then we're going to test it on the rest. That's the dev set. And DSPY makes this easy by providing us, a, us with this import for labeled few shot. And we can choose how many examples we want to put. 
Uh, here we've got eight. Uh, so that means there are going to be eight examples that appear before the question is asked. And what we do with this label few shot optimizer, so we've basically initiated it here with eight, with eight few shot examples. Now we've got labeled few shot optimizer. We're going to do what's called uh, compile um, according to DSPY. And compile just means it's going to uh, kind of inject or prepare those few shot examples for when we're ready to prompt. And um, there's actually no optimization here, even though we're using an optimizer and we've called it an optimizer. It would be better if I called it maybe a preparer because it's literally just injecting uh, some examples pretty much at random into our prompt, which will help. So we're going to take uh, this labeled few shot optimizer and we're going to try evaluate the 50 questions again. So just to go through this, we're going to run evaluate on the dev set. So this is the questions we're not using in the few shot. Uh, num threads is just how many parallel requests. We're just going to do one. You could speed it up by increasing that. Uh, display progress true. That's the progress bar. And then display table is five. We're just showing five examples here out of the 50. And the way that we're going to evaluate whether the questions are correct, and I, I'm just explaining this now, it applies for all the eval we did before, is true exact match. So the model will give an answer and we'll compare that model in exact match, that model's answer to the ground truth that we had from the data set. So here we are running evaluation. We're going to run it on the RAG model compiled, which is this model here that contains the few shot optimizer. And we're going to evaluate using this exact match. When I run that, and I'll just run this uh, cell here so I can keep following, we now move to 27 out of 50. So we're up to 54% from, I think, was it 40 something percent? Uh, so this here helps a lot. So let's take a look at how the few shot examples are added. And let's see if I can check out what the few shot looks like. Um, I don't quite have an example of it here, but let's make an example. So I'm going to do rag model combined and let's just create a new code cell here. This will be instructive. And I'm going to copy the same way that we made an answer up here by just um, doing something like this. So I've got rag model combined. I'm copying my code from above. This is already defined. So I just need to slot in rag model compiled instead of rag model. The difference being that I'm compiling now with the few shot examples. And let's roll forward on this and calculate pred. And let's just call it, um, let's call it pred few shot. And we'll print the result. Ooh. So yeah, here we have the result. It's giving the context and it's given the answer. And you know, I like to inspect. So I don't remember the inspect command. Thankfully, I can just scroll up here and copy it. This will allow me to inspect one back in history. So copy that here. And now we can inspect. And as you might, uh, as you might expect, we have the question, but now we have these eight uh, examples. And this kind of gives extra context for what types of answers should be provided. And we have followed the following format. All of this is very much the same as our uh, example where we had chain of thought plus rag. So nothing has changed there. What has changed is that we've injected these eight examples. And as I said, this does actually improve performance. As you can see above, it's getting us up to 40, 54% um, versus we were in the 40s before we'd provided the few shot examples. Now it's well known providing few shot helps performance. So this is really just providing a structured way to do that. Now we're going to move to some of the more advanced techniques. Now we'll move on to some more advanced uh, stacking prompting techniques. So here we're going to optimize the few shot prompts. Uh, so the logic for this is as follows. You have, uh, it, it, you have a helping hand if you put some examples within your prompt, that's well known. But why not take that one step further and actually optimize which few shot examples you put in? Now, how might you optimize them? Well, what you can do is test out at random some few shot prompts on a portion of a training data set. So out of this Q&A, we have the training portion. Why don't we generate some random few shot examples or rather select, not generate, select some random few shot examples and test which set of few shot examples gives the best performance on the test set because that probably will give us better performance on the eval set as well. 
So it's kind of like fine tuning. We're not actually changing any weights in the models, but we're optimizing the specific examples we put within a prompt. And the way we optimize them is that we test whether the answers on the training data set um, are going to be correct. And in fact, we'll make it even more strict. So we are only going to accept a set of few shot examples if it leads to correct answers on a certain number of the training data set. So we're going to bias the selection of few shot examples towards the ones that lead to the better answers on the training data set in the hypothesis that that will help us with the eval data set. And this is all done uh, in a wrapper that's called Bootstrap Few Shot. And it's bootstrap in two ways. So it's bootstrap in a first sense because it's better than randomly picking few shot because it tests all of the few shot. Well, not all of the combinations, but it tests many combinations to identify ones that lead to correct answers. But further, it's bootstrapping because this is a multi-step query. We first are going to ask a question. Then we'll use that question to generate a search query. We'll use that search query to retrieve answers. And then we're going to use that retrieved information to answer the question. And at each of those steps along the prompt, we're going to have a full generated end-to-end -end example. So it's bootstrapping from start to finish that correct uh, prompt. Now, if you don't follow that, don't worry, because it'll be clear when I show you an example. For now, though, what we're going to do is um, determine how we evaluate on the training set. And we're going to do it in two ways. We're going to check that the answer provided in the training example is an exact match, but also that it's contained within the retrieval paragraph. Now, that might not be the way to check the correct answer in general cases, but here, probably the correct answer to the question is also going to have to be in the Wikipedia article. Otherwise, we probably have retrieved uh, the wrong article too. So we set up um, a teleprompter, which is kind of an optimizer, using the bootstrap bootstrap few shot that we've imported uh, from DSPY. And we're going to set a metric, which is checking for exact matches and passage mass matches. And we're going to use this to compile our prompt. And when I say compile, I mean set it up with the few shot examples, but no longer just random few shot examples. They will be optimized few ex shot examples such that those few shot examples gave correct answers on the training data set. So to compile this here, um, and maybe I will just run it. Uh, it's going to select at random some few shot examples. And I've said that I'm going to use a training set of 20. So it's going to go through those 20 examples and see um, if it's able to get some correct answers. And what it has found is that after running 10 examples, so 12, 10, uh, sorry, 12 random sets of few shot examples, it's found four cases where it's been able to trace from start to finish and get to a correct answer. And these uh, are going to be the four traces that we will use as few shot examples um, here. Now, I may be mixing up some of my, my words, so let me just clarify that every single example here is just testing one question in the training set. So we test one question at a time. Clearly, eight of these led to wrong answers, so we're not going to keep those, but four of them led to correct answers. So we're going to keep those full traces as our few shot examples. So now when we ask this question and when we inspect the history here, we'll see the injection of four examples, if what I'm saying is correct. And yeah. So first off, right from the top, the prompt is getting long. We have answered questions with short fact of answers. We give eight few shot examples that are pure um, pure short examples. And actually, it's more than eight. Why is it more than eight? So I think what we're doing is we've got a default number of few shot examples, which seems larger than eight. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we're doing 12 few shot examples. These are not end to end. They're just few shot. Then we have the instruction where we follow this format. We have the context, the question, the reasoning for chain of thought. And then we've the answer between one and five words. But now here come those four uh, optimized or optimally chosen, I should say, few shot examples. So we have this full example here. We have this full example here. Uh, this third example here. This fourth example here. So that matches what I said. We've bootstrapped four end to end examples. So we're really giving tons of examples. We're giving 12 uh, short 
few shot examples, and then we're giving four optimally chosen uh, examples. And here we get um, the context, the question, the reasoning, and then the answer. So this, uh, now we want to test out on Hot Pot QA and see how many of these we get correct. Uh, so we'll head down and do the evaluation. This time we're going to pass in compiled rag, uh, compiled and optimized few shot examples. And here we're up to 58%. So I think we're in the low 50s and now we're up at the high 50s. So by providing these full end-to-end -end examples, we've expanded out a little bit again, the quality of the answers we're able to get. So where can we go from here? Well, um, there's another idea that's in a paper by someone called Baleen. That's why I think it's called Baleen here. And what it does is multiple steps of retrieval. So this is getting towards what perplexity does. If you use perplexity for search, I think that's perplexity.com or is it .ai? Let's see, perplexity.ai. You can uh, use that. It will retrieve information in multiple steps from the internet. And that's what we're going to do here. And we're going to do it uh, with a simple, a simple search query where we have an input field, uh, a question, and then we have an output field, which is going to be the query that we're searching for. So you can think of this as asking a question, then the language model generates some search terms that it, could, that it should search for, and it will use that to search Wikipedia. Now, perplexity would search the internet, but here we're just going to search Wikipedia. So. Let's take a look at this uh, simplified Baleen setup. When we initiate a simplified Baleen, it's going to have a generate query, which is a chain of thought. But notice that it's going to use this multiple times. So we're going to do multiple searches, uh, multiple hops. Basically, we're going to generate a search query, get some results, pull back those results, and see if the language model wants to generate another query. And actually, we're not going to see if it wants to generate. We're going to force it to do it number of hop times. You could alternate it and put a, an exit clause so it can exit if it finds what it needs. No exit clause here for now. We're just making it do uh, two different retrievals. And later, I'll show you three. So we generate a query with chain of thought, but we do it uh, three times. And each time it has the benefit of the prior information. Then we're going to run retrieve. Um, so this is our retrieval. And we'll do that for each of these uh, hops. Then we'll generate our answer using chain of thought. And here we're just setting uh, max hops. So these are just initiating here. It's actually not showing a flow. I've kind of described it as a flow. But these are just all being initiated. The flow is actually described in the forward method. For every hop in the range of hops, we generate the query. We get some passages. We add those passages uh, to the context. And we deduplicate in case we get the same passages again. And when we've done that three times, and you can see that when we go back and generate the query, the next time it has the benefit of all of the previous context. Uh, so it should have a sense for what new to search. And we'll see that when we go through detailed history. And once it has this accumulated context, it will make a prediction, which means getting an answer using that context. So let's uh, try and run that on the simple question here on the stories in the castle. And let's do it for two hops. So we're going to get a prediction from uncompiled Baleen. Again, uncompiled means we are injecting some examples. Actually, are we injecting examples? No, we're not even injecting few shot examples here. We're simply asking the question with two hops. So no few shot examples, no optimally chosen few shot examples. And we run this here. And I do have to run the Baleen cell up here first. So I also need to run the generate search query. And now this should run. And so we have uh, how many stories, predicted five stories, and it prints out the context. But really what we're interested in is checking out the history. So let's see the history here. So I only want to print out one really, uh, just to see the very last portion. We can go back and see more then. So in this very last request, we have answer with short factoid answers. Here's the context. Here's the question, the reasoning, the answer. And you can see there are no zero shot, no few shot examples, neither of the short QA or of the complete uh, compiled answers. And here is the context. You can see we've retrieved six passages because we got three and we got three more on the second hop and none were obviously overlapping. So that's why we have six. And so the answer to the question here is uh, five stories. Don't know if that's right, but it, the idea here is just to show you what this looks like when we've got two hops. And actually, we can go back and see what those uh, hops look like. 
So if we go and scroll up, we'll see the request that led to one of the queries. So this would have been the second query. Write a simple search query to answer a complex question. Uh, follow the following format. And here's the context. And the query it provided is this. So this you can think of a, as a Google or perplexity search query, or rather Google search query. Here it's a Wikipedia search query. And we can go back further in history to three steps and take a look at what the first search query was. So on the first hop, it asked for David Gregory inherited castle number of stories. Now remember, we're trying to find how many stories there are. And then when it has the benefit of the context, because now it has context when it tries to make a second search query, it's changing to say Kennedy Castle number of stories, architectural details. And it's able to make this more precise query because it knows from the context that the castle is Kennedy Castle. So this is why the multiple hops helps. It's like search for something. And if that tells you something, generate a better query. And yeah, hopefully that intuition is clear for why the multi-step and this is why things like perplexity work well for doing search. So we've added in this notion of two hops and uh, we can run that to see what the performance would be over all of the questions. But what I'm going to go to straight here is adding in the few shot examples. And again, we're not going to put in random few shot, but we'll put in optimized few shot examples. And the way we'll do that again is by using a training data set. We'll randomize some few shot examples, pick a random few, a random example, test out whether that leads to a correct answer on the training set. And if it generates a full trace, we'll add that as an example to our prompt. Again, we're using both exact match and uh, the answer passage match if we want to get uh, those two things to match. So we'll run that through and then we will uh, call the teleprompter, uh, which is our optimizer, to compile that. And you can see from what I ran earlier, it ran through 20 training examples and it only managed to get three uh, full traces leading to a correct answer. So that means we have three examples that will be injected when we ask a question. Now, if you like, you can evaluate the quality of retrieval to see if it gets the passages that we expect it would. I'm going to skip that for now and run immediately to a test of the compiled boolean, which means compiled with optimal few shot examples. How many stories are in the castle? We have a prediction, but more interestingly, let's look here at uh, the n equals four. So the last four calls, the first call will be to get um, a query. In fact, it should be n equals three. So I can just scroll down to uh, the first one here. So write a simple search query that will help answer a complex question. We've got the chain of thought included here. And you can also see we have uh, some few shot examples. So we have one few shot example, two, three. So we've got three examples here, and then we have the answer. So here's the query um, that it's asking for. It's actually asking for and. This is not really what we would want. So it shows you there's probably room for improvement in the prompting. Then it will get the context, pull that back, and make another search query. So here we've got, again, write a simple search query. We've got three fully bootstrapped examples. Note now that they include context, because on the second time round, there's always context available. These were generated, remember, using the training examples that led to a correct answer. So we have three of these, and then we get a new search query. And notice how this uh, search query is following the same syntax. And after this search query, we've retrieved up to six paragraphs and we're ready to answer the question. We've got 12 probably, um, zero shot, 12 few shot examples, just short QA. Then we have, um, I think we'll have three fully bootstrapped examples after this request here. So we've got one, we've got two, and we've got three. And now we're ready to ask the question and we've got the question and then the answer. So you can see this is an extremely guided process and we have found three examples that can be included that led to correct answers in the training set. So we're using those now in the dev set and that hopefully will improve the performance. So let's see if it does by evaluating again on Hotpot QA. So we're evaluating compiled Boolean here. And this time we run it and we get 68% correct. So that's up uh, from the high 50s. So we've, we've kind of brought it to the top level now. We've added in chain of thought, the few shot examples. We've optimized those few shot examples. We've allowed for two steps of queries, which uh, improves the quality of retrieval. And we've even optimized the few shot examples for those full multi-step processes. 
And when we pull all of that together, and I should say, I did run the evaluation as well, where I have no few shot examples, but I am using the multiple hops. So here we've got uncompiled baleen. Probably should have moved this up above, but this is basically running with two hops. Uh, you can see, you can't see the hops here, it's written above. But we're running with two hops, we're running with chain of thought, but we're not running with any few shot examples. And if you inspect the history uh, from that, we need to, we should do n equals three. You can see the search query here. It's got no few shot examples in it. The next search query here has got no few shot examples. Um, and the answer, sorry, so here's one search query. Uh, here's the other search query and there are no few shot examples. And then here is the question, answer question with short factoid answers. And then it actually isn't able to find the answer in this case. But that's a one-off test. Um, I was able to run the full evaluation too. And I'll show you the scores here. So we have now a comparison of all these steps. The very basic uh, approach, no chain of thought, no hops, no um, few shot examples, scoring 20%. Chain of thought brought us to 34. If we add in retrieval, it brought us to 42. Maybe surprising, retrieval didn't help more than that. Adding in few shot examples helped again. Adding in optim optimally chosen few shot examples uh, with fully bootstrap traces uh, brought us to 58. So not all that much difference there. Then adding in two hops, um, not too much difference between these two, but note that this test here does not include having any few shot examples. So really you have to compare this one here back to the retrieval step here alone. And you can see it goes from 42 to 60. So definitely adding one hop significantly improves retrieval. And I would say probably adding in a second hop is going to be better than just making your retrieval bigger in the first place, because the benefit of the first retrieval is going to make your second retrieval more accurate. And then last of all, when we optimize the choice of few shot examples, we're able to get up to 68% in total. So all in all, you're seeing pretty significant improvements in the answer quality here by adding in some of these prompting techniques. I would say a lot of this is maybe not new to you, but hopefully it is new or at least useful how you can do this in a structured way and probably a lot faster because you're using these wrappers, uh, albeit it takes a bit of time to get your head around how the wrappers work. Thankfully, if you just copy paste a lot of this into ChatGPT and ask it to rewrite it for your purposes, it will probably be able to write it with fairly high accuracy, especially if you do some tests intermediately. So I think the barrier to integrating something like DSPY is not all that high. Now, just a comment here. I did run using three hops of retrieval for those interested. Uh, would it help if you keep doing retrieval? And yeah, I would need to rerun this again, but broadly speaking, and you're comparing here with here, 54 to 58. It's kind of within the same ballpark, so I don't think it's significantly improved anything. Perhaps it has disimproved by adding in irrelevant information. I'm not sure. And then if I add in three hops with an optimal choice of few shot examples, I get to 66%, which again is basically the same as 68. So no significant improvement here by adding in a further hop of retrieval. Now, just a quick uh, comment here on another technique. This one here is called assertions. So in the same way, we check when we use the training set that the few shot examples will give the correct answer. You can further filter out any answers that are too long or don't meet some other structured format. And I'll very quickly show you, I'll put this link down below. It's another notebook uh, from HotPot uh, using HotPot QA by DSPY. And let me show you a quick assertion here. Um, so if I go down and I check... So here, if you look in the forward method of this uh, simplified baleen, so we had the baleen approach, it's the multi-hop uh, type of querying process. You'll see here that when we do a query, we basically add in a check that the query should be short and less than 100 characters. And if it doesn't pass this test, then that uh, sample, that choice of example to include in the prompt will not be allowed and we'll move on to another example. And furthermore, um, there's the ability to provide information so that if the model is giving an answer that's too long, we will basically send back to the model this indicator that the, mo that the query should be short and less than 100 characters. And you can think of many different assertions you would run. Here's, run that checks, here's one that checks that the queries are distinct. So if you have a multi-step multi process to generate a query, but the next step generates the same query, 
you can basically throw that one out and indicate to the model that the next query should be distinct from the previous queries. And so this is a little bit like a kind of structure generation, but with recursion. And it allows you to filter the quality of answers, not just based on some test data set, but also on attributes like the length or the specific content of those answers. And this is again going to lead you to more robust and predictable types of answers you get from the LLM. And that is it for this review of very structured prompting using DSPY. As I mentioned, if there's interest, I'll further I'll go further and make a video on using agents with DSPY. You can find some of the links. There are many free resources in the DSPY um, notebooks that are on the GitHub. And I'll also provide a link to the advanced inference repository if you want to get access to the Trellis versions of these scripts. Let me know any questions below. Cheers, folks.